Greek syntax. Does it really matter? Jesus seemed to think so. And in this video, we're going to look at how Jesus carefully looked at the grammar of the scriptures in order to refute those who opposed his teaching. Hi, I'm Daryl Burling from Master New Testament Greek. And each week I talk about the tools, habits, and systems that you need to master the Greek of the New Testament. And this helps you grow both spiritually and academically. Now, if that sounds like something you're interested in, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and hit the notify bell so that you're notified when new videos are released. Now we all know that grammar and syntax is important. We cannot speak, we cannot communicate without it. But is the same thing true when it comes to Christianity? Is the same thing true when it comes to the Bible? Should we really read it that carefully? Is it really that necessary? Or can we just skip the grammar and just get the general gist of it? Well, let's have a look at what Jesus said about this very issue. And he actually did this in Mark chapter 12. And in Mark chapter 12, you remember, of course, that the Sadducees came to him. Now, a couple of things about the Sadducees, of course, is first of all, you need to realize that they denied the resurrection. They said there is no resurrection from the dead. Not only that, they also regarded only the Torah as scripture. So the rest of the writings and the prophets of the Old Testament, they regarded as non-inspired, not scriptural. So these were additional writings, but they weren't inspired scripture. Only the books of Moses were inspired scripture. And one other important thing about the Sadducees is that they thought of themselves as the interpretive guides for the scriptures for Israel. And so the, really the amazing thing about this was here is Jesus correcting those who thought of themselves as the interpretive guides of scripture. Now here's what they say. They come to him and they say there's seven brothers. The first one took a wife and died leaving no children. The second one married her and died leaving behind no children. And the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. And in the resurrection when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. So the idea of this question is it's supposed to refute the idea of the resurrection. It's supposed to make it look ridiculous. But there's some assumptions that they make about the resurrection, specifically that the resurrection is really a continuation of this life, which is mistaken. Now, having said that, though, Jesus objects to this whole scenario that they put forward. In fact, he says very clearly, clearly on account of this, are you not deceived? Right, So he's really using this word planaste here to say they're deceived. And this, this word has the idea of being led astray or wandering aimlessly. Uh, it's used of stars that are wandering, uh, wandering stars, that kind of thing. And you might notice that this verb, planaste here, is a middle passive present tense verb. And normally the passive verb indicates someone else acting on the subject. And the, but the passive form of this particular verb does not necessarily imply external involvement. It doesn't mean that somebody else is acting on the subject. And in fact, you can look at this and see that there's no agent supplied. Normally, when there is somebody else acting on the person that they have in mind, there's an agent supplied, the hupo plus the genitive, or something like that, or a dative, to indicate that somebody's acting on the person who's been acted on. But that's not here. There's no agent supplied. And in the active voice, this particular verb is normally transitive. And that's going to identify who or what is being deceived or led astray. But when this verb is passive, like we see here, it's intransitive. And it indicates then a, a change in the state of the subject. And so Jesus is simply saying they are deceived. They have been led astray. In fact, they've entered into this because the passive provides a little emphasis on them, suggesting that they have been engaged in allowing themselves to be deceived. And Jesus here is pointing out the true state of the Sadducees. They are deceived. They've been led astray from the truth. And so his first answer is that they are deceived on the first on two accounts. The first one is not knowing the scriptures, not knowing the, the writings. And this goes back to their rejection of the prophets and of the other writings of the Old Testament. And so as such, it undermines their status as interpretive guides. These guys aren't qualified to be interpreters of the Old Testament because they've rejected a whole bunch of the Old Testament. But more than that, they've even failed to understand the books of Moses themselves, the Torah. The Torah does not, as they assume, support their rejection of the resurrection. And so we're going to see this because this is where Jesus goes next. He says here, concerning the dead that they are raised, have you not read in the book of Moses at the bush 
how God spoke to him, saying, here's Jesus' translation from the Hebrew, Ego hothios Abraham, and so he's saying, I, the God of Abraham, or I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And here he's really referencing Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. This is one of the most famous and best known passages of the Hebrew Old Testament, and particularly of the Torah. And so here's this piece in the Hebrew, and you'll notice here that first of all, there's only one verb. Uh, That's this word just here. Uh, This is the only verb in this passage. There is no verb following that. So the words here in blue are really where it picks up what God is saying. And again, this is just a pronoun. This is just I, God of your fathers. And here, this is actually what's called a nominative predicate. And so the the pronoun I and then God following it is a predicate arrangement. And so this implies that there's this verb am in between. So I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And so the first person personal pronoun implies this present tense equative verb to be or am. I am the God of your fathers. And in fact, this is reflected in the Septuagint. So in the Septuagint, you have ego a me, hothios. I am very explicitly understanding that verb to be there in the Septuagint. But Jesus, when he translates this in his translation, he uses a nominative predicate. He takes that same Hebrew construction and uses the Greek equivalent of it, saying, and not, not adding a verb in, but understanding that just the predicate construction itself implies an equation that equates both sides of the predicate, both the, the subject and the predicate itself. But the point of this really is to say that here what Jesus is doing is he's building on this implied equative verb for his whole point. Okay, so here's what his implication is. If God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then on the other side, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must be alive still. And this means that the Torah assumes life after death. Okay, and Jesus is doing this on the basis of the fact that God is not saying, I will be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The assumption is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive, and so God still is their God. Okay, and so that implied verb is the whole linchpin of what Jesus is getting at to argue for the resurrection against the view of the Sadducees. And so he's saying here that they don't know the scriptures. And it's not that they've never read the scriptures. That's not the point. The point is that he's saying you've not read the scriptures carefully enough. The nominative predicate speaks to both sides of the clause. God is, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob also are. In the same sense that God exists, so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob also exist. The Sadducees here are assuming one, they assume that God is, but they are denying the other side of that, the fact that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob also are and continue to be. And so he's demonstrating that they have not treated this text of Scripture as seriously as it deserves to be treated. Now, the second part of his response is that they are deceived because they do not know the power of God. And this is really quite a serious accusation. God's power is one of his attributes. So, and in a sense here, if you go to the end of this passage, he says he is not God of the dead, but of the living. And here he's making an assertion, not merely about God's power, but about the nature of God himself. And so the implication here is that they actually have mistaken the person of God. This is a statement about God himself. This is not merely a question of doctrine, but of theology proper. Who is God? That's the point that they've missed. And so therefore he concludes this whole account by saying, you are greatly deceived. So let's summarize then what we've seen here. We've seen here that Jesus actually pays very careful attention, not only to the Hebrew syntax, but even to his translation in to Greek. Secondly, we've also seen that the Word of God deserves to be carefully read. These are God's own words, His own communication, and so we need to read this very carefully. And this is what the Sadducees had failed to do. They did not read the Word of God as carefully as it deserved to be read. And they were therefore deceived because they had not given the Scriptures the attention that they should have. And the result of this was that they had fallen into doctrinal error on several categories, not only by rejecting the prophets and the writings, but also by rejecting the resurrection itself. And ultimately, they had a false view of who God was. 
and the result of all of this was that their spirituality was corrupt. And so we can conclude from that that yes, syntax definitely matters. So syntax is important if you want to avoid deception and avoid doctrinal error. But syntax is also important if you want to understand who God is and you want to understand therefore how to rightly live in relation to him. So yes, syntax is very important. So here's the question I have for you as we consider how carefully scripture needs to be read and how important the syntax of the word of God is. What do you do to ensure that you read the word of God carefully? Now, there's loads of reading plans out there. Reading the Bible in a year is great, but how do you ensure that you read it carefully? Leave your, your comments and your methods in the, in the comments below because I want to learn from you and find out how you read the word of God carefully. So let me know in the comments below. So I'm Daryl Burling, creator of Master New Testament Greek, which is focused on the tools, habits, and systems to help you master the Greek of the New Testament so you can read it as carefully as you possibly can. If you like that kind of thing, if you're into the Word of God, if you love the Greek, then go ahead, subscribe to this channel, and hit the notify bell to be notified when new videos are released. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. See you then.